Welcome to Life After Fame podcast. Just imagine 70,000 fans cheering your name when you've scored the winning touchdown. Imagine standing on stage looking out at the crowd, rocking out to that chart-busting song you created. The applause and recognition you received for your masterful acting performance in that latest blockbuster movie. And then, one day, the cheering stops. This podcast is all about catching up with these stars of yesterday to find out where they're at now and who they are as people beyond the stardom. This is a true human interest podcast about the people we loved to root for. And now your hosts, Joe Mastriona and Joe Boglino. Kelly was the son of an All-American and collegiate icon who had finished third in the 1976 Heisman Trophy and drafted in the second round by the Denver Broncos in the 1977 NFL Draft. Kelly's dad had a seven-year NFL stint before his injury-riddled body put him out of a career. Kelly had a front-row seat to his dad's struggles out of football. He saw firsthand how his dad's sacrifice to play the game he loved ultimately cost him his life. By the time Kelly's dad died at the age of 56, he had an artificial knee, an artificial right shoulder, persistent headaches, a mind that had begun to distance itself from reality, vertigo, and a carpal tunnel so severe that it stripped all the feeling from his hands as he fought to sleep at night. This is the Rob Lytle story told by his son, Kelly. It's a very personal and insightful story about the relationship between father, son, and professional sports. This week on Life After Fame. Welcome to Life After Fame. We have a really special guest today. I I would say a unique guest here on Life After Fame. Because you see... This podcast, we interview mainly uh, the actual former athlete, coach, musician, celebrity. But today we have a little twist with our guest. We're joined by Kelly Lytle, son of former Michigan Wolverines star halfback and seven-year pro NFL player for the Denver Broncos, Rob Lytle. Kelly, thanks so much for being on the show with us today on Life After Fame podcast. Welcome to the seat. Thank, and thank you so much, both of you, for having me. Um, it's always a pleasure to get on and kind of share these stories and have an opportunity to, I love what you all are doing and the way there's the human picture, right, that goes behind that. It's so part of everything with this idea of life after fame. And so just grateful for the chance to be here and thankful for being on with you both. So thank you very much. Awesome. Well, we realized that, Kelly, the lives of these former athletes, stars, whoever it may be, are not just solely about them. Because a lot of the times they do have families, they have wives, they have husbands, they have children. And so we're really thrilled to have you on today to not only share your story, but the story of your dad, Rob. We were introduced to you, Kelly, on an article in USA Today that talked about your relationship with your dad and his professional career, but really your experience with your dad and your family's experience with him after he had retired. So once we dug into that, we found out you wrote a book that's called to dad from Kelly. Really create title there. (laughs) Hey, I love the simplicity. Straight to the point. And it's available on Amazon. We'll include a link down below so that if anyone wants to look at this and I would tell you, and I'm not being patronizing here whatsoever. It's very well written. It's a very personal account. And it really shows an interesting light on a witness to someone who had achieved such professional success and what they went through during and what they went through afterward. And I want to start this out with reading just a couple of pieces from your book to give the audience an idea about what we've got here. You write, football obliterated dad's body. He had suffered double-digit concussions and doctors repaired his damaged tendons, ligaments, and joints in almost 30 surgeries. Dad suffered from a functional addiction to painkillers for at least 30 years of his life. You also go on to write that his mentality and what you saw was that football heroes fight through their pain 
Uh, if not, they place their manhood and legacies at risk. The great ones are heroic despite their injuries. And you write his body was like a junkyard of used parts. He absolutely sacrificed his body for the game that he loved. He had a singular purpose. And you write that when your dad was eight years old, he told everyone, I'm going to be a professional football player. Wow. You talk about manifestation right there as an example you state what you want and then you drive to it and you say that he craved everything all the brutality and the suffering all the joy and even the heartbreak that football provided him even its most painful gave dad his identity and his purpose um it was his great love but <laughs> you had a, obviously a very close relationship with your dad Talk to us about what you saw and some of the things that you wrote here in this book are so personal and an admonition to what he went through. Yeah, a absolutely. And, and appreciate all the kind of the kind words and everything with the book and with the story. And as you mentioned, it is a personal journey. And I know we talked about this a little bit ahead of time, but I was writing through my own grief. And anybody who reads the book, it is evident, I think, from sentence one or two. And that was a very healing, in many ways, a very eye-opening experience for me. And it, it's interesting to say this, given I wrote the book after dad passed away, but in many ways, it brought us closer together and connected us in ways that I think emotionally, perhaps we didn't when we were alive, because like anything, you take for granted the thing that is right in front of you, especially a special relationship mm -hmm. like we had. And I'll touch on some of what I witnessed from him from a football standpoint or a life after football standpoint in a second. But I will also say just the idea of a special relationship is exactly what I think dad and I had. I always describe him as my dad and my best friend. And he was a special father. He was one of those humans who, and it was just remarkable. And you talk to anyone who was ever in his presence. He was one of those, and this is kind of cliche to say, but it's so true with him. You felt like you were the only person that mattered when you were interacting with him. He had that ability to just, you felt special. He made you feel as if everything else around was non-existent. And it was just about you and your story and your connection in that moment. And he was just on top of the fact that he brought in the NFL background or the college background. And so you just were oftentimes mesmerized by this human in any edit. We always used to say a very devilish grin. And so that kind of charisma in everything that went with it, uh, just a wonderful person. He was the guy who was out there every Sunday in the fall with my friends and me playing catch, right? We'd play games at two on two or three on three or four on four with him as all-time quarterback. Like that was every Sunday. He just, because he didn't care what part of football he was part of. Just give him the chance to be part of it. I think I mentioned it in the book, but while we're here, so he had a shoulder surgery that went awry and he ended up ultimately having to have his right shoulder replaced. But for most of my time growing up, he couldn't lift his right arm. So he couldn't throw a football. So he taught himself how to throw left-handed. Just so he just to be out there with the boys, yeah, with the boys. Wow. Like he just wanted to be a part of it. He would awesome. drive down to the field. He had, there'd be a, Dalmatian in the front seat. There'd be three or four or five of us in the back seat of this Jeep. Dad would be driving. And it was just, those are just memories. Everyone involved, right? Those are just in our brains forever. And they were so special. And so football brought so much good. It brought so many good memories to us. I talk about this in the USA Today piece, right? That nostalgia, that co connectivity. So much of my life, that through line is football, especially because dad was there. But then the other side of that is what the game did to him. And admittedly, up to the point when just before he passed, all he ever wanted was another play. And he always said he would do it over again. It was a really unique thing to witness, right? It, I always start about his hands. And so 10 fingers pointing in 10 different directions, all of them broken, arthritic, this pinky shot out this way type thing. And you watched him and thinking back on it, it's all the little things. Like you watched him try to stand up from the couch and you just see the pain in his eyes, right? He's grimacing. He's trying to stand, watch him come down the stairs in the morning and you just see how much effort, how much energy, how much strength and fight it is just to take those steps day in, day out because of what he committed himself to and what he gave of himself to football and passed before we were really learning what we know today about 
CTE and brain damage and concussion component of football and the repetitive hits. And so everything that we witnessed really was the physical deterioration of this person who was a superhero, right? He was a superhero my whole life. He was infallible. He's indefatigable until that moment he wasn't. And then does hurt behind the scenes because there's so much below the surface suffering going on too that I don't even think he probably understood or recognized. And we certainly didn't and learn it after he's passed. But it's like most things in life, there's so much good. There's so many other considerations that go with it. There's one thing to say, he loved every second of playing football and being part of the game. And that was from the time he was a little boy to the time he was nearing the end of his life because it still captivated him and he just missed being a part of it. You actually even have a chapter in your book that says he was actually heard saying on an NFL Films documentary that we leave football, but football never leaves us. The interesting thing about this, in a sense, I kind of feel that after his career ended, it was a torment for him, yet he still embraced it. We've talked to other athletes on this show that have just left football. It was so disappointing, so heartbreaking that they had to leave the game until they could recover, mourn, and then eventually come back to it. You talk about being a kid, you grab your friends in the neighborhood, and he was the quarterback out there throwing with his left arm. He didn't shy away from it ever. Not once did he stay engaged and even dealing with the kind of loss that he, I think he felt in his heart about his career. He he did. He did. And that's an interesting thing. And excuse me. And I'll share this a couple of things. One is after he retired from Denver, there was an opportunity to stay on and explore the coaching route, explore continuing to be a part of the organization that way. And he couldn't do it, right? It hurt him emotionally so much to not be a part of the team and playing that he just had to get away from it, right? He moved from Denver back to the hometown of Ohio. And so that it's torment is a very good word because he struggled missing the game so much immediately afterward and then throughout his whole life. How do you go from achieving the thing you've always wanted to achieve and then it being gone and taken from you by the time you're 30. And for dad, it wasn't even being a fan of football. It was playing football, being in the locker room, feeling the way morning dew would seep into, he'd always talk about that, right? In the fall, the way it seeps into your cleats before a game, before kickoff. And just the fall, the way that fall smells and feels and the cracking of leaves walking to practice, just all of those things, just he gravitated to all of it as well as the competitive aspect, the physicality and everything. And when he left and they left, my mom and dad left Denver. If you ever talk to my mom, I mean, she'll tell the stories of here's this almost superhuman person who's been a football star in, in this kind of personification of toughness in so many ways for his whole life. And the years after he retired in the mid eighties, they would be home and my sister and I would have been put to bed at this point. We were, we were very young and they would just be up on the couch listening to, to, to records and he would just sob and he would just cry and he would just talk about how much he missed the game and how much he missed playing. And mom was there. It's why it's always so important for me to make sure that the human aspect of these of former players, former athletes is told because she was there on the couch all of those nights trying to rebuild and restore him. Uh, obviously, he grew and some of that fades over time, but it just hurt him so much to not be a part of the game. And then the rest of his life, he was always somewhat connected to football. He could never leave it. He coached at the high school level. We used to joke, he coached our flag football team. And you can ask my my friends from like 1992 or three will tell you he was the first person to ever run the zone read because we were running it like back in the early 90s. That was the <laughs> offense he put in from the shotgun. And uh, so he was always involved that way. It's really toward the end of his life in late 2000s, the high school where he played, where I grew up in in Fremont, Ohio, he worked on the, they called it the chain gang, but he would work on the first down markers during the home games. I don't think he had any responsibility. He was just kind of there and usually ended up with the referees or the other coaches or something. But again, that was Friday night under the lights, fall, it meant you experienced the game of football. And he wanted to be a part of it, especially at that level, at the high school level where there's so much joy and it's a little bit closer to being kind of the business side of it is not as prevalent. And it's just the kind of purity and sanctity of the game. And he just he needed to feel it. He needed to feel connected. And that never changed from the time he was a boy through the time he passed away. 
So Kelly, we're all affected, good and bad sometimes, by our fathers. Certainly he was your hero, like most of us. Our dads are heroes, and I can't even imagine my dad being an NFL player and that hero level just even rising. Did that drive you? Because I know you were a pretty damn good athlete in Ohio. (laughs) And uh, did that inspire you? Did that drive you to be like, I'm going to be like dad? I'm going to be like that, and I'm going to play this game. And tell us your story about your journey with football and sports in general and what that yeah. looked like. Yeah, ab- absolutely. And that journey started <laughs> right before I was born. So <laughs> September 12th, 1982, opening day of the 82 NFL season. And mom, I think they were playing the Chargers. Mom looks over at dad, and he's like, not today, tomorrow, the next day. And she's like, nope, we're going now. And so we headed to uh, headed to the hospital in Denver. And uh, I was born just before kickoff. Dad got a police escort from, I think it was St. Joseph's Hospital to mile, Old Mile High Stadium wow. and made it on time for kickoff. Got my name announced over a loudspeaker. There's an old cartoon. I'll dig it up. I'll send you all the image. There's an old cartoon in the Rocky Mountain news, Rocky Mountain Post, making fun of dad with this crying baby <laughs> coming and everything. And so... We blocked a punt that day. And so right off the bat, sports and life and family and fathers and sons in that relationship, we were intertwined from the get-go. And what's really unique about dad is, and these are things that I've learned with hindsight. I didn't know them when I was eight or when I was 16 or even in my 20s. Of There was never a spoken pressure, right? There was never, you need to live up to my legacy. In fact, dad would never even have said those words. Dad and legacy, he was too humble. He was too modest to ever even think of himself that way. And so there was never pressure to do that. Having, of course, though, his history playing football, playing sports, the moment I started playing and I had some success as a kid and was able to thankfully have successes through high school before injuries and different things kind of derailed that. With dad, it was always, if you're going to do something you're going to commit to it and try to be the best you can be with it. And that means you're going to sacrifice whatever it takes to be the best. It means you're going to outwork anybody else around you. It means you're going Mm -hmm. to put in the effort, the energy, the sweat equity, the everything that goes with it, because there is no other option. That if you're going to do something, you do it to your fullest, you do it to be the best at it. And that's what he knew. And so when I gravitated towards sports as a, as a kid, of course, in hindsight, right, because that was what was so important and meaningful for him, he never said, hey, you have to practice this way. You have to get up in the morning in the summer while your friends are sleeping and do an hour of ball handling drills while you watch repeats of the wonder years and then go out and shoot 500 jump shots. But I did because all I ever heard, right, was how he was revered for his work ethic, his commitment, so, his self Wait, I have, I have to interrupt you just for one sec, Kelly, because you said he never did tell me to do that. But did he? <laughs> he might have did it through his actions, right? And telling you, hey, this is what I did. Yep. I was pretty tricky on maybe your dad's part. I think and, maybe a little tricky oh, way, yeah. a subtle way to say, hey. This is what it takes. And that's what he believed. And that's, there's nothing wrong with that. It, but I think exactly. he was telling you. It, and exactly. And that's what one of those things you come to recognize as you get older. Like it was there, right? It, because it was, hey, these are the things I did, or these are the things I watched others do. And yeah. you just internalize it. And so yeah. maybe it was never, <laughs> you do this, but it was, right. this is what we do if we're going to do it. And I always tell the story because people always ask, what if you would have told your dad, hey, all I want to do is, be a writer or whatever the case may be. And he would have said, you know what? That's awesome. Let me show you how hard you have to work to be the best writer that you can be. Or the best, no inj- you know, no knee injuries involved. Exactly. Right? So it, yeah. it, it, I could have said, hey, I, I want to be a pastry chef or I want to be in X, Y, and Z. And he would have said, okay, you have to do yep. this. You have to do this. Yep. This is how you commit. Yeah in order to really embrace it. So that was his mentality. That was his everything. And so it was one of those remarkable things too, growing up where in terms of you having the best imaginable coach who was also your father and who you also knew had so much of your best interest in it, just all growing up, being able to go out and 
throw the football around or track. We would go to the track and we would work out together when I was in my teens or in even preteens. And just having somebody that had been there before had been through all of these things. So you knew when he gave you advice, I couldn't dodge it. I couldn't avoid it because it was, he's like, well, he had a lot of credibility. Yeah. He had so much credibility Mm -hmm. and all of that. Yeah. The hard work making it. I mean, he was, well, he's in the college hall of fame. He was a star running back at Michigan. He yeah. was, he came in third place in the Heisman Trophy candidacy one year. So, yeah, if you're not listening to him, then you're, and, yeah, you're not very smart. So, yeah, yeah I, I would have been the same way, Kelly. I would have been listening and hanging on every single one of your you dad's to. words. And there's so much positive there too, with especially the way that dad operated with which is humility team over self-sacrifice commitment everything and the story that came out and told all the time in the michigan circles is going into the 1976 season that senior season michigan was absolutely loaded rick leach at quarterback they had dad at running back they had russell davis they had harlan huckleby they had jim smith as a wing back they had arguably to this day probably still one of the most talented backfields you could ever imagine and The year prior, dad had split time with Gordon Bell, Gordy Bell at tailback. And Bo came to him and said, and here's dad. He's going into his senior year. He's at a thousand yards. He's all big 10. He's a Heisman Trophy candidate um, and likely a future draft pick. And Bo says, what about playing some fullback? Would you play fullback so we can get all of our talent? Can we get more talent on the field? And dad asked, if you, do you think this will help the team win? And Bo said, absolutely. And he said, then let's do it. And so he played most of his senior year, or or at least split a lot of time between fullback and tailback, still had, I don't know, 1,500 yards and finished third in the Heisman. But that's always the story that would get told in Michigan circles of, here is a person whose only question was, will this help the team win? And when that is your captain, when that is your teammate, you can't help but follow it. But then when that is your dad, you also can't help but like internalize a lot of that too, because you see how much that type of attitude, that type of mentality, it drew people to him. People gravitated toward him because they said, here's a person who is going to give of himself to create a better outcome for all of us. And that's a very special trait to kind of have innately. You suffered knee injuries. You had had a thriving high school sports career right? In basketball, track and football, you were on your way, you were following your dad's footsteps. And these injuries got you just like they got your dad. I think your dad was injured six of the seven years he played for the Broncos. Do you think as you're lying there in, I think you said you were vomiting from the the anesthesia and going through those surgeries. Do you think your dad ever thought, maybe I'm not such a great example because I put my son in this spot. He's pushing himself so hard And now he's found himself where I have found myself and I'm not happy. Right. Do you feel like there was any, anything around that at all? I think that's a a amazing question and kind of reflection in everything, because I think, and it's one of those things that it hurts me thinking about it. And it makes me sad thinking about it, that I don't now have the chance to ask him that question as I've matured and as age sort of takes away, sort of breaks us down a little bit. And I think the answer would have been yes. And he absolutely felt that way. And I think he would have said, you don't have to do this. And I think about the, you don't have to be me. You don't have to follow me. And I think about it, and and this is something I've actually never put into words. So I'm very happy you've asked the question since the first time I'll sort of voice this outside my own head. Um, So yes, so I've had a very up to this point, my junior year of high school, very successful high school career was being recruited by major colleges for football, for track, et cetera, et cetera. And then I had reconstructed knee surgery, the first of what became two surgeries in two years. But I remember that first one and I'm just out of the surgery and it's still a fog because the anesthesia and I'm nauseous and I'm sick. And I asked that and I said, will I ever play sports again? Will I ever be back? And the answer was, yes, if you want to. And I often wonder if that little if was him not knowing how to give me an out, but wanting to give me an out. 
and not make it that you have to then go on this almost maniacal mission of rehabbing and recovering the way that I did my whole career, the way that people talked about it, I heard about, and they revered him for too. And I think that I think about that if along with his comment too was always make sure that you use sports, don't let sports use you. And so for him, it was always important to use sports to get you into college or to get you college paid for or to get you connections or whatever the case may be. Don't I and I think he then never said, don't let it chew you up and spit you out and leave you always wanting more the way it did me. So he never framed it that way. But I think those things were there inside of him. And I think there was a part of him that said, if he were being honest, and he would have been, I didn't necessarily want this for you, or that you could have chosen another way type of thing. And I would love to be able to have that conversation. Mm -hmm. It's one of those things that, you know, just won't, won't happen. But you know, you play it in your head as you you're out walking the dogs and doing those things. It's hard to be a parent too. It is. It's so Mm -hmm. hard to be a parent because you're caught in between two worlds. Yep. A lot of the times he was there, of course, because that's who he was to be inspiring to you. Yep. But I agree with you. I think maybe there was maybe some hesitation because he's your dad. And yep. at the end of the day, he loves you more than anything. Doesn't want probably to see you go through the same pain and the suffering that he went through. And your yep. dad, I have to say, was one of the toughest SOBs ever. In the National Football League, college football. I mean, he, Bo Schembechler even said, he, in your book, you mentioned he uses him as an example for future generations of players and saying that, hey, Rob would go out there and play. You're hurt. You're injured a little bit. Suck it up because Rob would do it. And I can't imagine as a Michigan player following your dad, you look up to those guys and you're like, okay, I got to do this. And so you mentioned also as, as well in your book, Kelly, I think you, you put it so good and I'm not going to, I'm not going to even try to articulate it as well as you did, but you talk about toughness is so admired. It's almost like a badge of honor that we wear as males, especially in football and sports. And we walk around wearing that badge. And I wonder, is that a detachment from our true selves, from our true emotions, uh, being vulnerable, being uh, okay with saying, hey, I am injured. I can't go out there. But it's the worry of, what is this going to get perceived like? Or again, just back to that real shiny badge of like, yeah, I'm a tough son of a gun and I'm going to go out there and grind it out to the detriment of ourselves. Yep. I think that absolutely is the case. And I think the other piece that happens is especially, well, in, in male culture, but especially in the world of football and in the way toughness has always been revered and elevated as a trait that is necessary, right? We need football because we need to teach men to be men. Well, okay. What does that mean? We're also, are we teaching them to go run your head into a wall 25 times an afternoon and, you know, perhaps suffer the ramifications from that too. But it's that badge of honor that the way that toughness is revered, it becomes rewarded and reinforced then from the time that we're little. And that reinforcement and those rewards mean you seek more of the rewards in other aspects of your life and more reinforcement in other aspects of your life. So it could be as simple as you need help on a project at work, but I can't ask for help. I got to tough my way through this to the detriment of my relationship at home. So I'll work 20 hours a day. It could be oftentimes our own mental health, our own emotional health, because we're bottling because I can't let the facade crack. I can't show you that there are chinks in the armor. And the story that I remember, and in, in, in I think I tell at some point in the book, I mentioned it. it was fall 2009, and we went to a high school football game. And it was about a 40-minute drive away from where we were. And we went to the game. We stood on the sidelines, and we watched it. And I, I don't, we didn't really know anyone, but it was a high school team. It was just it's October, and it's this perfect fall night. Stars are out. We're watching a game. 
we're driving home and we're talking. And I remember dad turning to me and he looked at me and it was this first time I can remember the idea of dad as the indestructible hero was cracking. And he looks at me and he says, Kelly, I am tired all the time. And there's this hint of vulnerability. There's this hint of sadness. There's this hint of admission that there is something that he cannot stop that is wrong with him. And then he turned, started driving a little bit. Then he smirked over at me and he said, but I'll tough it out. And I just Mm. said, I know you will, dad. And I didn't really think about it. But that moment, you don't, there's so much that had always been, he did tough everything out and he did work through those situations. But that night, that was the night that I wrote most of what became the eulogy I read a year later at his service, because I knew that something was wrong. I knew that there was something behind those eyes that just, it was him struggling. He didn't know how to admit it. And I certainly didn't know how to then raise the subject afterward and say, dad, what's going on? Dad, do you need help? Because I didn't want to admit that either. And that's where that vulnerability and the process of writing and the thinking about it afterward has really been healing for me to open up and say, no, and we have to admit these things that the actual tougher way is to say the actual example of toughness Mm. is to say, hey, I need some help here, but I don't know what I need but I need something. I need you there with me and being open to that and letting others into your own pain is going to be the actual thing that we need. Being vulnerable actually is maybe the toughest act that you can be, but being vulnerable and I am still working on this as a man. I wasn't taught that either. I don't think any of us were. It's a old patriarchy. Like you have to be the watch the old Westerns and you got Clint Eastwood that the way he dealt with problems was drink a bottle of whiskey and go shoot people and not because his best friend got killed in the saloon. Right. And that's what we learned. But the reality is the strongest, toughest act that I've learned that you can have is to be authentically vulnerable. And like you said, sometimes you don't even know what for or why but you just go forward and do it. So that's a great point. I just wanted to reemphasize the thing about toughness, right? We can all sit around the bar and we can show the scars and the scratches. And I have this broken knee and I have this broken elbow, but you cannot talk about your, the six inches between your ears. And Kelly, you talk about, we were all taught that stereotypical toughness, right? Yeah. However, I think what you said was important. What Joe just doubled down on here is that, Maybe, just maybe, if he would have just said, I'm going to tough it out, he just said, I need to go get help and opened up, maybe. maybe. And I hate to even say it, but maybe that might have prolonged his life because Mm -hmm. he would have gotten the help he needed. And I think that's what men, a lot of people have a hard time with that, right? It's so hard. It's so hard. And we've talked about it and said it, right? We're not trained. (laughs) We're not trained in it. We're not taught it. We're not conditioned for it and everything or so much else around us then reinforces or accentuates the opposite of it. And so it takes a lot of relearning or deprogramming to come back to it. And I think about it oftentimes of just the way we could always use football or sports as a crutch for meaningful conversations. And it was enough for me to accept dad to say, Kelly, I just missed the game. Or I just want one more play. And then he'd wink and say, I want one more after that. (sighs) And that was enough. That was meaningful. That was great. What I wish I would have done, right? The conversations we wish we would have. Well, Mm. well, why? Tell me more about that. Or Mm. I watch you every day suffer with a pain pill and a this, and this is how you get through it. And you're a wonderful father and friend. But is that right? Is that healthy? Is that really the trade-off that you're happy with? Let's talk about that. And I don't think we ever really are ready to have those conversations, right? It's easier to think about having them after, like when you would never, you're never, I'm never able to have that. So it's much easier to say, I wish I would have had it. But those are the ways that just toughness in football and in sports and those things can take the place. And I think this is common for so many 
men especially, can take the place of that just let's go a little bit deeper into that and have a little bit more meaningful, more vulnerable sort of expression and conversation because it's not a sign of weakness. It's not a sign of not being tough. It's not any of those things that we hear growing up. It actually is going to lead to a richer, more fulfilling experience, especially with the person you're with right there. Yeah. In fact, vulnerability is a great sign of strength. But when you're walking down the hall in middle school and you're getting bullied by some guy, you cover that up. And here's the interesting thing about your dad, too. This is why this book is really important, I think, for people to read and your message out there. Your dad was maniacal about what he wanted to go for, and he achieved success. He achieved great success. He played in multiple bowls. He played in the Super Bowl. In fact, he scored a touchdown, the only touchdown the Broncos had in Super Bowl twelve. But this is the saddest thing about it. I wonder what success looked like for your dad because the success he achieved was something he regretted. He didn't feel like he achieved anything, I don't think. I think based on your book, it just feels like he was a disappointment. What would success have looked like for him if what he achieved wasn't successful? I honestly don't know. I, or maybe that isn't the fair answer. The fair answer is, I think he would have said success would have been the only definition of success would have been being the greatest running back in the history of the NFL and the history of football. And that maniacal drive, there's a positive to it, right? The positive is the work ethic, the humility, the self-sacrifice, the commitment, the dedication, all of the things that carried him to where he did get to. That's the positive. The negative. The duality of it really is that then how many experiences along that journey did he not embrace? Did he not really sort of hold on to celebrate champion? Because for him, it was always the next thing. And while that's great, right? It's driving him towards goals and the next mountaintop, the next accomplishment. That's wonderful. But for him to not be able to then stand, step back and be able to understand a, how important, how amazing he was, right? Orange Bowl, Rose Bowl, Super Bowl, NCAA All-American, College Football Hall of Fame caliber, able to play in the NFL, a, a, a fraction of a fraction of like 1% of athletes ever achieved that. And for him, he was never able to see that as success. It was always his career was a failure. He lost those bowl games. He, he didn't have a thousand yard season in the NFL. And so he viewed himself through that lens because he set his idea of success in a way that was frankly unattainable because for him it was perfection. And so, yeah. Be, being a witness to that, Kelly, are you successful? Do you view yourself as successful? <laughs> I am able to speak pretty freely about how he viewed himself because I go through many, or if not all, of the <laughs> same challenges along the way. I like to think that the piece that I've perhaps taken that he did not have is the ability to, at least after the fact, recognize it, slow down, step back and reflect. But it is a challenge in the moment. I think about it all the time. One of the things when I was writing to dad from Kelly or in other endeavors is there's a great line that's pretty common out there. Don't compare the start of your journey or the middle of your journey to the end of somebody else's, right? But yet it's so hard to not be celebrating, hey, I published a book. It was a lifelong dream to publish one book in my life. And I did it. That is a success. That's great. That's a wonderful thing. Instead, right away, well, I'm not as successful as this author. I'm not as successful as that person. Edwin Pulitzer. Uh, exactly, comparisons right? just steal our in, joy. I know. And I've the learned that. Comparison is a thief of joy. steals your joy. Yeah. Exactly. And Kelly, you're, you're not alone. Your dad wasn't alone in that Yep. Maniacal thought process. I think a lot of us struggle with that. I mean, even on my smaller level, not compared to your dad, have struggled with that as a man, a human being, whatever you want to call it, yep. where you reach these goals and then it's like, not good enough. What do I and do then I, I think about, yeah, what's next? And it's like, you have to celebrate where you're at. Don't compare yourself to anyone. And it's just feeling good enough about yourself, being okay with, because there is no such thing as perfection. I know we all continue to keep trying to strive for that and drive for it, but there's no such thing. 
And it just strips us of our happiness in what we're doing and what we're trying to achieve. And then it makes us question ourselves all the time. I mean, hey, we're babies into this podcast. And I can't tell you how many times I've wondered and questioned myself, am I doing a good job here on the podcast? Because right. there's like one billion podcasts too. So so I've got a lot of comparison to do. That's what I basically stay up all night <laughs> yep. wondering about. So I don't think that your dad was alone. You're not alone. And I want to tell our audience, you're not alone. Exactly. However, and we can do it differently, right? That's exactly that you're doing differently yeah. than your dad. You're doing it. And I want to honor you for that because that's something that hopefully you're acknowledging. You're doing it differently. I see it. It is. And it's not too, it's an interesting thing because there's, you know, some folks, some people will say to me, there's a part of you that should be angry with your dad about what you, the unconscious learnings, right? The unconscious teachings that that you kind of have in those things. And obviously, and, but it's not, it's about celebrating the totality of the relationship and the, the connection because the life is always shades of gray, right? There's good, there's bad, there's ups, there's downs, there's everything in between. And I always think about it, there's all these amazing lessons that that I took from him, caring for others, humility, just there's so many things. And then there's also the comment I heard my whole life, anyone around him heard, was practice doesn't make perfect, but perfect practice makes perfect. So go be perfect. And you'd like, okay, I'm going to go run through a wall and go run like 100 today as fast as I can. And then I'll get like, wow, you did great today. You get rewarded for that. Yeah. And yeah. when you're training for a game or a competition, that's fantastic. That's the type of mentality, if in its own bucket, that can be really helpful. It can lead you to something that's really successful yes. and, and yeah. achieving goals and milestones and pushing beyond boundaries that you never would have otherwise. But then in other moments of your life, it can also lead you down obsessive or compulsive or very maniacal evenings where you're saying, I can't send even this email because it's not yet perfect. Or I can't deliver X to a boss or I'm going to take an extra year to edit a 130 page book that most people can read in a night because it's not yet up to that standard of perfect when the actual thing should have been to get it out the door and work on the second one. All of those things. But you know what? Like it wouldn't be life and it wouldn't be dad and it wouldn't have been our relationship without all of that whole. And so let's celebrate the totality of it. Sure. Yeah. And and the last point I want to make about your dad, as I was reading your book, thinking about him, thinking about you, I think a lot of people will take the message as football. I mean, there's no proof, but football took his life early. And maybe there's a lot of regret there. Maybe there's this, there's that on the negative side. But how I looked at it is because you said this numerous times in your book, Kelly, and I picked up on it. My dad would always say how much he loved the game and he wanted one more play. And when you have that kind of passion in life, even though maybe outwardly he didn't always show maybe the joy. I believe he did have joy because love that word kept coming out. When you love something, all I can end with is saying, well done, sir. Well done, Rob Lytle, because he absolutely did what he wanted to do and what he loved to do. And there's a lot of people walking around this planet that aren't doing that. And I want to encourage them through this story, go do what you love and do it to your fullest extent. Now, that doesn't take away the pain of his son and his daughter and his wife losing that man early. But hopefully that can give you a little bit of relief. And I'm sure you've thought about it, that he was doing something that he absolutely just cherished. And I think that's awesome. Absolutely the case. He is a person who, best way to describe him, who loved and cared deeply. And he did that for football, which he loved his whole life. Did that for my mom. And they were together since they were in high school and cared so deeply about her. 
He did it for my sister, for me, for our friends. He's a person who, and this goes back to it, to what I was saying, when you talked to him, you felt connected to him. You felt as if you were the person, only person who was in the world in that moment. And that's because he cared deeply and he cared deeply for people. And he's a person who, like every other human who's ever lived, who is fallible and imperfect and all of those things. But dang, if he didn't love with his whole heart, give to this sport that he was so passionate about, that he so cared about, and that he took so many great lessons from and love his family above everything else and put himself in, not just say it, but show it in everything he did every day. And you know what? That's a heck of a life. That is a heck of a life, no matter how long you know it was. And it, he's, a, he's a special person, amazing to have as a father, amazing to have as a friend, and I'm grateful for every minute that we had with him. So the book is by Kelly Lytle about his dad and his relationship with Rob Lytle. It's called To Dad from Kelly, a memoir about fathers and sons, lessons and questions, life and death. It's a really good read. There's a lot of great points in here, and it spots like a lot of things we go through. So we hope everyone takes a look and checks it out. It's on Amazon. We'll put the link at the bottom of uh, at the bottom here in the notes section. And uh, Kelly, thank you so much for sharing your story with your dad and bringing his real greatness and goodness back to life here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both for having me. This is a pleasure, and I'm just grateful for the chance to share the story. Thank you so much, Kelly. What a heartfelt interview with Kelly Lytle, the son of former NFL player and Denver Bronco, Rob Lytle. In this episode, we took a different look through a new lens of Life After Fame's kaleidoscope never taken before. It's through the eyes and experiences of a family member. In this case, a son, a best friend, which is so relatable. This interview was both heartwarming, heartbreaking, and inspiring all in the same breath. You can pick up a copy of Kelly's book, Two Dad from Kelly, a memoir about fathers, sons, football, and life lessons learned from someone lost too soon. The book is available on Amazon. You can also follow Kelly on Twitter at Kelly underscore Lytle. Thanks again to all of our Life After Fame community for listening to our show and supporting us. We truly appreciate each and every one of you. This podcast is a true human interest podcast intended to entertain, educate, inspire, and support you in feeling connected as a community and as fellow human beings. We hope you enjoyed that episode. If you haven't done so already, make sure you hit subscribe. And to find out about previous episodes and new episodes fresh off the presses, please visit us at lifeafterfamenow.com. That's lifeafterfainnow.com or by subscribing anywhere where podcasts are found. Join us every Tuesday as we interview a new guest with a new and unique story that you're not going to want to miss. On behalf of this episode's guest, author Kelly Lytle, son of former NFL player and Denver Bronco Rob Lytle, I'm Joe Mastriona with my co-host Joe Boglino of Life After Fame Podcast. Have an amazing week, and we'll catch you all on the flip side.